Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce this last tutorial of this conference uh, from three researchers that have been there together, working together for a long time already. And, and, and it's, uh, you, can, you can say from, uh, from their pub joint publications how deep, impactful and insightful their research is. So I'm following them uh, since already, I, I would say 10 years, but maybe it's more. And uh, it's impressive uh, uh, already the results that they are getting. And today we have a very nice tutorial bringing a bit the, 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 the result of their last research collaborations. Let me first introduce the, 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 the authors of this tutorial first, uh, alphabetically speaking. Abidor Gal is a faculty, faculty member at, at Technion. We all know uh, Abi, he made a, a brilliant keynote uh, uh, on, on Tuesday. Then we have Arik Senderovic, he's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And um, finally, we have Matthias Weidlich, which is a full professor at uh, Humboldt University at Berlin. So I, I'm really looking forward to this spectacular tutorial. Uh, just a few words about before starting. Remember, there is the Q&A and the chat so you can use any of both. I will be monitoring that so that if you have any question, please don't hesitate in asking. I will simply, or you can simply interrupt and then the, you can interact with uh, the presenters. There would be a question and answering at the end, uh, as far as Arik uh, said. So, but if you find suitable, please don't hesitate. Having said that, the floor is yours. Great uh, colleagues, please go ahead. Thank you for the great introduction, Josep. Um, it's my pleasure to present this tutorial on Q-mining, or how Will van der Alst once referred to it, the marriage between queuing theory and process mining, um, jointly with uh, Avi and Matthias. So let's get started. Um, so our plan for today is to give you some motivation and background on queuing models and queuing theory, uh, a little bit in the beginning, and then we will present uh, three data stories that reflect three different queuing abstractions or three different types of queuing models. We will start with call centers, uh, which typically correspond to a single server queuing model. We will then, Avi will take it from there and generalize it to queuing networks where the routing of the different customers inside the network uh, of the cases is predefined or no. And then Matthias will generalize it even more um, by going into a healthcare example where the routing is random and we will see how our results uh, from part one and part two can be generalized um, to accommodate for that. And at the end, we will uh, talk a bit about some opportunities, challenges, and provide concluding remarks. And then we will also open the floor uh, for everyone to comment on these challenges and ask further questions. But as Josep said, you can, uh, uh, Josep will interrupt me if there are questions in the Q&A. So the motivation for, for our work is congested systems. Uh, systems that have queuing present due to, for instance, scarce resources and all kinds of uh, synchronization delays. Um, this on the left hand side is a hospice, a walking clinic in the United States, a privately owned one. And we wish that most of our systems would look like that, right? People are even socially distant on that picture, more or less. Um, but oftentimes in healthcare systems, emergency departments look as follows. This is an emergency department in Israel and obviously in a very hectic time. And then sometimes uh, the healthcare systems even look like this. So this is a queue uh, into a very good uh, emergency department in China. And why is it very good? Because people actually want to go there. Uh, the bad ones are pretty much empty. Um, and here's a COVID picture um, taken outside of Costco when people were uh, hoarding for toilet paper. So as I said, scarce resources, a high demand and we get a congested system. Um, what is our motivation for analyzing these systems? Obviously performance analysis, trying to understand where our bottlenecks are, um, looking at dashboards on a weekly basis and trying to understand where can we improve the process. Um, another aspect is trying to give customers predictions of how long they're going to wait in the system because it is correlated with um, reducing uncertainty, reducing anxiety. You want to know if your flight is going to be delayed 
Uh, so this has impact on quality of service. And finally, we want to make decisions and optimize the process. Marlon was talking a lot throughout the conference about actionability. We want to look at the system, model it using the queuing model, and then help uh, the manager control the system and make better decisions. Here I'm giving the example of uh, ambulance diversion. If we know that uh, two out of our three emergency departments in the city are congested, we're going to divert the ambulance to the third one that is not congested to prevent from the patients from waiting too long to receive treatment. So this is a motivation. And if we're looking at uh, data, we will start with descriptive analysis, descriptive analytics that corresponds to the first part of trying to uh, analyze performance and detect bottlenecks. So let's play this video. This video is a simulation or an animation uh, provided to us by the Service Enterprise Engineering Lab at the Technion. Um, this is a hospital, this is a cancer hospital in Boston, an outpatient hospital where customers arrive to receive uh, chemotherapy infusion. So we can see that the, in the beginning of the day, the queues are building up in the laboratory area where their bl the blood of the patients is being taken there uh, for analysis. Then we see that in the middle of the day, this is May 20th, 2014, middle of the day, there's, a, there's a more of a volume and traffic here in the waiting for the exams. The video keeps restarting, so I'm going to comment on that as it restarts. And at the end of the day, the patients arrive to the infusion area where they get chemotherapy infusion, and we can really see how the bottlenecks evolve here. So this is the descriptive analytics part. We can accompany these descriptive analytics with additional statistics. For example, this is a similar animation that was, <clears throat> that was elicited from a call center data set. And then we can look at the development of the queue over the day. And we definitely see the morning peak when people call more, um, more often in the morning. And then there's the afternoon peak and we can plan our staffing, for example, accordingly um, and understand where our congestion is. So in the process mining literature in 2014, there, there was a work on um, trying to detect bottlenecks um, uh, by Luc de Schmidt. And in 2016, we kind of uh, extended these, uh, this work by looking at event logs with missing information. So trying to give descriptive analytics under some missing uh, log data. Moving on to predictive analytics, which is going to be the focus of this tutorial. We're trying to give the customer an estimate to the time until some event of interest. For example, when will the patients on the left-hand side here see the doctor for the first time? Not very soon, obviously. Um, or when will the next bus arrive, right? We see these uh, signs uh, all over uh, some of the cities. Um, and this is done in order to kind of try and reduce the uncertainty and help um, the customers of our system plan their journey through the system better, right? If I see that the bus is coming in 36 minutes, maybe I will take Uber. And as I said, predictive analytics is going to be uh, the focus of this tutorial. Um, in prescriptive analytics, not a lot of work has been done in this in, in terms of Q mining. Um, so one example for when we need pre prescriptive analytics, where, where prescriptive analytics and queuing go together is when we're trying to prioritize patients. Um, so obviously in an emergency department, we would prioritize them based on the urgency, while maybe in other places we want to prioritize customers based on fairness. Then the first come first served or the FIFO rule um, becomes relevant. Um, but also in routing decisions, which patient goes to which ward and sees which doctor, staffing decisions, how many nurses and doctors will I need, um, and so on. And I talked about ambulance diversion. So there is work to be done here, um, and, but this is not going to be the focus of this tutorial. Moving on, so we're, we're focusing on predictive analytics. And now I'm going to ch uh, try and uh, kind of chart the map of, uh, draw the map of how the, these works look like and the types of queue mining that we will consider today. Um, so we have a congested system that hopefully we collect some raw data about that system. So I would say that the green lane here would be uh, works on feature encoding. Um, there are works that take the single case perspective and try to encode features of a single case. Uh, more advanced works try to actually capture this intercase dependency between the, the cases running in the system and uh, essentially, these features are encoded and the training data is produced. 
And then out of the box, basically machine learning models, these can be neural networks or boosting algorithms are used in order to do the predictive monitoring or the predictive analytics. Now in Q-mining, we add two other paths to that uh, roadmap. In the first path, we essentially fit or mine a queuing model from that data. Now having that queuing model, we're actually able to give some predictions without going into machine learning because the queuing models give us uh, analytical expressions for how long, for example, a, a patient is going to stay in the hospital, what is the remaining time. The second path um, that more Avi and Matthias will talk about in the other parts is to first elicit a queuing representation, a queuing abstraction of the system, and then go and create the training data by encoding queuing features, and then use the machine learning technique. So I would say that we're, I'm going to refer, we're going to refer to the first path here as path one of queue mining, and the, the path that kind of closes the loop and goes to machine learning methods as part two, uh, path two. Um, any questions about this? Josep, you're, uh, I don't see the chat. Not so much, not so much. Perfect. Perfect. So um, when Q mining was born in 2014, it kind of contributed to two worlds. First of all, queuing methods or methods from queuing theory for predictive analysis, such that I mentioned before, were not really tested on real world data. So Q mining was kind of the first time that uh, on a larger scale, these theories were tested on real data. Before that, they were tested on simulated data or synthetic data. Um, while in the process monitoring world back in 2014, uh, there was not much work, there were not much works on intercase interactions or on congestion, on dependencies between the different cases. So this uh, stream of Q mining kind of contributed to both worlds, uh, closing a certain gap. Um, so at the heart of our approach, as I said, there's the queuing model. So let's try to understand the building blocks uh, or the, 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 the declarative way that we define queuing models. We use for this declarative definition, uh, we use what we call Kendall's notation. Uh, Kendall proposed it in a paper from the 60s. And essentially, as I said, it's a declarative way to define a stochastic process. So every element here corresponds to a stochastic element of our system. So if we look at a single server queue, what we have here is arrivals, and arrivals are going to be denoted by the, the letter A, and A will be replaced, for example, by the letter M for Markovian if it's Poisson arrivals, or by the letter D if the arrivals are deterministic, so the time of the arrival is well known, or by the letter G if it's general arrivals. So arrivals can be Poisson, completely random, Poisson with changing rate, deterministic, appointment-based, and so on. Uh, whatever you define here, you will need to also define for the analysis or for the simulation you're, you're conducting afterwards. The letter B corresponds to service times and service time distribution. So oftentimes in queuing theory, we assume that the, the service time is exponential and we replace the letter B with M. Um, and, but this is usually done for tractability. Real systems usually do not behave uh, in an exponential manner. Um, we actually see that a lot of service systems, uh, hospitals, call centers behave uh, log normally. So if you take the log of the duration of stay of, of the activity, you get a normal distribution. But you can also replace that with a G. So there are many, uh, for general, there are many results in queuing theory that are approximations of what happens to a very general system. The third letter C stands for capacity. And capacity here can be either static or dynamic. So I could uh, have five nurses working throughout the day without change or we could have a dynamic change in the number of nurses. For instance, the first shift is three nurses, the second shift is five nurses, the ninth shift is one nurse. And this all can be expressed as part of this uh, C definition. Um, moving on to the next letter is Y, and that stands for queuing. Ari, one question. What is yes. the relation between the server capacity and the, the fact that you have single or multiple server semantics? Is there a relation? Yes, so if you set the server capacity to be three, for instance, this is a multi-server semantics, meaning that there are three servers working in parallel. Very good, okay. thanks. Okay. Um, Why stands for queuing capacity, which is how, ma how, many, um, how many customers can I let into my waiting room before it gets blocked? Um, and when this letter is omitted, we're usually assuming, for example, in call centers that the capacity is infinite because my system can, um, 
can be very inclusive and let everybody in. But now with COVID, for instance, we're working with that hospital in Boston and now due to social distancing, people are encouraged not to enter the building and enter the waiting room until their appointment time is up. Okay, so we've been uh, Ari, the yeah. A nice question from, from Dirk, he says, some queues have a special semantics. Uh, for instance, a conveyor belt will keep the distance between items. How is this captured in this notation? So this notation is, uh, does not capture every possible, uh, every possible thing that can happen in the system. What we usually do is we, uh, we start with a kind of, we start with a notation and we add some sugar on top of it, right? We add some uh, uh, explanation that, for example, the arrivals are Poisson, but each arrival actually is a batch arrival that contains a random number of elements. So if you want to add, add for instance, batch arrivals, or so we need to be, we need to continue declaring our model. Um, so this is a compact way of representing models, but that's, uh, that's definitely that has its limitations and you might need to add uh, additional assumptions beyond what you see in this. Hopefully that answered the question. Dirk, why don't you try in case you want to add anything to talk? Because I don't know if you are allowed. I think you, you are allowed. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. thanks. We, that, that we, chose, uh, we chose a meeting mode on yeah. purpose so that people can unmute themselves. Ah, okay, okay, very good. Right. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. That's good. All right. Then the letter Z stands typically for the service policy. It's replaced by either first come, first serve, which is the kind of the default, uh, usually for fairness. But there are other policies considered in the queuing literature, last come, first serve, processor sharing. There are actually works that are trying to learn that function from data using machine learning. So you can imagine a machine learning algorithm that sequences the patients according to what it has observed in historical data. The plus X here is something that has been added when call centers start to be analyzed. So before call centers, these models were usually um, used for transportation and um, communication networks where there's no notion of abandonments. But in call centers um, and sometimes even in hospitals, patients become or customers become impatient and they can hang up. So the time until that hanging up happens, uh, if they did not get service, is called the impatience and is typically assumed to be exponential as well. Um, but some models are general enough to make it G, general. Now this, this uh, single station model is essentially one building block of a network of queues where you can also add the, the letter R for routing. So for example, if we have a Markovian memoryless routing between the different stations, let's say I finished in station three and now I'm flipping a coin and I'm moving to station four with probability 0.5 and to station five flip that coin. So this matrix can be represented by this um, R notation. So uh, these are the basic building blocks. And to just and to give you an example of how this is instantiated, the very common example, the first kind of example in a, in a basic stochastic processes course uh, is MM1. Now we see that the letter A is replaced with M for Poisson arrivals or Markovian arrivals. The letter B is, repla is replaced by M because the service times are assumed to be exponential. Um, the capacity is just a single server. And the letters Y, Z, X are dropped because there is no limit on the Q size. The Q size can grow to infinity. Um, Z, the, the, the service policy is first come, first served. And there are no abandonments. Okay, so this is the, the easiest kind of Q to analyze, both in the transient sense. So we have, I now arrive into the queue. There are five customers. I want to predict how long I'm going to stay in that queue but also in steady state to try and understand if the queue is a bottleneck or not, if the queue is going to explode or not. Right? So in queuing, there are two types of analysis, transient versus uh, steady state. And the first one is good for prediction, that what we're going to talk about. The second one is good to try and analyze if the system uh, has a bottleneck and whether it's going to explode or not. Um, so how do we feed the model? We, we need to basically use the, uh, the data to feed all of our um, parameters in that model. So essentially, if the, the arrivals are Poisson, we need to feed the arrival rate and so on. So we're feeding the structure of the process, which is the routing. We feed the dynamics, the arrivals, the service times. We can even learn the scheduling policies from data, as I said. And once we have that queuing model, we get for free, if the model is simple enough, we get closed form expressions. So we don't need to simulate to get answers for the expected waiting time condition on the queue length, for example, which is very useful for prediction or the expected queue length over time, which is very good for descriptive analytics, 
right? So there are the, there are works in the process mining literature that try to fit um, and model interarrival times in, for business process simulation and other works. Um, one point here is that in queuing models, what's frustrating sometimes is that you change the, the assumptions a little bit, you make them a bit more complex, and the, the closed form is lost. Right? So the model is no longer tractable, and now you, you must simulate it to get uh, to do the analytics essentially. You must now simulate the model in order to give the prediction that you want uh, in a rolling horizon fashion. So that's a comment that you need to remember when working with queuing models. I think one, yeah. one question from someone that has no really knowledge about this. So I know there is some, some work which is, I think, can process networks where you have not just one, but you have, you are describing the whole system by the, the and the interconnection matters. So to me, maybe it's, it's me, uh, it's only me, but I, I understand that you analyze this as an isolated uh, set of parameters, not as a whole, you know, structure of, of, of interrelations, or, or I, am I wrong? So I was focusing in my explanation on, thanks for the question, for the, on, on the single, uh, single station view, but indeed this can be integrated into a network and then we can fit these parameters jointly, right, in the network. Thanks, thanks for the clarification. Okay, thanks. And that brings me, by the way, that's a very good question, that brings me to the, to the first data story. Uh, and the story is about call centers uh, that correspond to single server queues. Um, so in a call center, we have calls arriving and we have a group of agents that are serving these calls. Uh, for now, we will assume that the, the agents are homogeneous. In a more general setting, the agents can be generalized to be heterogeneous agents. Some of them are technical support, some of them are languages. The customers, we're going to assume for now that they're all single, uh, single class or single type of customers. And we have other works that extended this to essentially several types of customers that can arrive and be served by several types of agents, but I'm going to leave it, we're going to leave it out of uh, today's tutorial. And now it's a bit related to Joseph's question before, are these models useful beyond call centers? Because we know that business processes are usually more complex there are different activities, there's a control flow aspects, there are choices and end gateways and so on. And I have, a, I have two answers because this is something that I'm typically asked. So first of all, analyzing a single server model gives you insights regarding the network because it is a building block of the network. And oftentimes uh, under certain assumptions, queuing networks can be decomposed into many single station queues and analyzed separately and then brought together in a composition. Um, so that's one answer. It's a building block for a network. The second answer is that usually in process mining before 2014, I'd say we used to analyze the remaining time of a case or the time it takes to get from start to end um, by simply saying, okay, here's my process model and let's maybe simulate it or use some kind of a regression analysis that will not take the intercase into account. And so imagine that this whole activity of an agent is this business process, right? So the, this, this is a doctor, the doctor needs to make some decisions, uh, maybe in parallel, there is some blood work that is arriving and so on. So from start to end, there is a business process. There are several steps, order of steps that the doctor must follow um, to examine this one patient. However, in order to analyze how long will it take for a patient to leave the system, we must look both at the delay before they enter the doctor's office and at the different nuances inside, what, what ha what's happening inside the office, right? So you can think of it, there is a complex business process here. We close it in kind of this white box because we can or, or we may or may not want to acknowledge what's happening inside. In the simple examples I will show you, I will not talk about the, the control flow of the agent in the call center. I will focus mainly on predicting this delay because this is kind of what Q mining, Q mining brings to the table. Uh, it's not so much the time spent here, it's more like how do we add this delay into account? How do we take this delay into account? Because the total time in the system is the delay and the processing time and the process time that happens here. So this is kind of a twofold answer to the question how useful these single station models are. And now moving on, we have the following problem. So we're trying to simply solve the problem of we have a target customer, uh, the fourth customer in Q here that arrives. Uh, customers can abandon. This is kind of a setting where abandonments are allowed. How long this customer is going to stay in that station? Or more like, how long will they be delayed in that station? Because uh, predicting their service time or time in that business process I've shown you before is something that was already handled and we know how to do it. 
And we're, I'm going to show you quickly how to use the two paths, path one and path two, to do so. So for path one, we're simply going to fit the queuing model that we need. Uh, in that paper, we use statistical techniques for fitting the GMN plus M model. General arrivals, we don't need to assume anything, and I will comment why this is the case. The service times are going to be exponential. The queue capacity is M that can be estimated from the data by looking at the number of overlapping servers, and the, the abandonment is assumed to be exponential. Now, why don't I care about the arrival process, whether it's Poisson or not? Because we assume first come, first serve policy, which usually is adhered in call centers, for fairness. Um, that's not always the case when we have multi-class uh, call centers, but for single class call centers, let's say first come, first serve is a reasonable assumption that can be relaxed. And therefore, when I arrive into the system, I don't really care about those that arrived after me. I'm only influenced by those that arrived before me and I see in front of myself in life. Um, so what do I do in, in, in path one? Once the queuing model is fitted, if it's without abandonments, then uh, queuing theory tells me the expected waiting time is going to be the number of people in queue plus one over n mu, with n mu being the effective service rate of that system when it's congested. When I add abandonments, it becomes a bit more tricky because then I need to take into account the abandonment rate of the system. And so um, essentially, I will not go into the details of how we get to that uh, result, but we have results in queuing theory that tells us how to uh, predict delays given that you all have a fitted model. Given that you fitted the model, you have closed form expression, as I said, and that's what I meant. That's the first type of predictor called the queue length predictor. The second type of predictors that is a bit more general and generalizes well, as uh, Avi will show you soon, is called the snapshot predictor or the, the snapshot estimator. What is the idea here? When I arrive into the system, there is this purple customer that has recently started their service. Okay. So when I'm arriving, I'm asking that purple customer, who is the, the most recent customer to start service. So he is the, the most recent customer that had to wait all this time until they got into service. And I ask them, how long did you have to wait? And, if, and the answer is W. And this W is the, le the, the last to enter service predictor. There's no learning here. Uh, I simply arrive into the system and I ask how long I'm going to wait. For the machine learning people, I think that it's nice to think about the snapshot predictor as a K nearest neighbor predictor. It's just that the metric of distance is not, uh, let's say Euclidean, but it's a temporal relation or a queuing relation that um, I know exactly who to ask um, for the time that they had to wait. And this works in systems that are in steady state. It's a, it's a nice heavy traffic result from the 80s from queuing theory, but this is actually the optimal predictor in such a system. If the system fluctuates a lot, this prediction is not going to work well and it needs to be adjusted. For the second path, uh, we, uh, in the first paper, we did something very simple here. We clustered the queue length in the historical data into heavy load, moderate load, and typical load using three means clustering, and we predicted based on the average delay in each of the clusters. We then, in, 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 in our follow-up work, we extended it and encoded queue length and other queuing features into machine learning methods, but I will not go into that, just to show you how this works on real data. So a very basic learning-based technique, I would say a very naive regression that simply partitions the data using k-means, and then for every customer that arrives, we say, okay, this customer arrived in heavy load, we're going to give the average of the heavy load prediction. This ar customer arrived in moderate load, we're going to give the average and so on. Um, and we tried this uh, approach in, in the first paper on an Israeli call center uh, coming from a bank. Uh, we focus on a single type of customers from that call center uh, called the general banking customers. They're 70% of the bank's customers and they have dedicated agents. So at least some of the queuing assumptions we made um, held in practice. Uh, the training log had over 250,000 delays for the year 2010, and the test log had uh, just under 120,000 delays um, for the next year. And we separated it by time so that we don't have um, issues of uh, causality. Right? We don't want, we don't want um, to mix uh, the training and the test in terms of time to have a causal relationship between the two sets. And the results were, we got were as follows. So the worst thing you can do is use the long-term average to predict, right? So you arrive into the system, you ignore the load, you ignore how many people are in front of you, and you're giving a prediction of the historical average of uh, what went on up to that point. So this is completely, uh, this completely lacks context, and we see that this uh, yielded in the worst results. 
the y-axis here is the root average squared error. Uh, the x-axis, we have the three, the three scenarios, heavy load, moderate load, typical load, and the all load scenario aggregates all of these. Now, the no information means long-term average. Um, for the k-means, this is the improvement that we suggested by first clustering the data according to the different q-lengths. Um, the QLM is the Q-length predictor that I've shown you before. And the snapshot prediction, the last to enter service, is the one in purple and the one that performed best across all scenarios. Now, of course, you cannot get to zero here because there is some uh, intrinsic noise or, or uh, the irreducible error of the waiting time because we're not taking into account um, many of the aspects. We're kind of focusing only on the congestion aspects here. Um, Another thing I wanted to say here is that when we try this without taking abandonments into account, this really messed up the results. So in queuing systems, uh, there is this fine line between uh, overfitting and underfitting, I would say. If you underfit and you neglect important elements such as abandonments in call centers or uh, prioritization in hospitals, you may get very wrong results. On the other hand, um, some of these simple models are really robust, and we see that without making too many assumptions on how, you know, how this thing really works in reality, and maybe, yes, the arrivals are sometimes batched, but we kind of ignore it, we still get pretty good uh, results. So there's this uh, trade-off between overfitting and underfitting here in um, queuing models as well. So with that, um, let's generalize the story a little bit, and I'm going to pass the control to Avi, who will talk about um, predicting delays in, um, in queuing networks with predefined routing. So I think the shift F5 thing should work. Uh, yeah. Avi, you're mute. Yeah, you're mute. Yeah, so um, I, I did that on purpose, so Arik can tell me that I'm on mute. Uh, he likes to do that in our meeting. <laughs> so, um, yes, hi everybody. So um, we're going to switch now to a little bit more uh, complex situation where uh, instead of a single server, we have a, a whole queuing network. Um, okay. So um, imagine that instead of having just one of these uh, red uh, cues that you see on the screen, you have multiple, and between them you have these edges that show you the path or the possible path for uh, moving from one station to the other. Now, um, we, at this point, we're gonna talk about networks of cues that may include, um, you know, either um, a choice or parallel uh, path, but the path is known in advance. So one such example may be, um, you know, a visit that is dictated um, um, where you go first. So like here you have the secretary, the nurse, the physician, and then you do these things in uh, this multiple lab, radiology and external physician um, in parallel. But this is all scheduled. Uh, the example that I'm going to give in a few minutes, this is about uh, public uh, transportation. And one thing that is nice is that the snapshot principle that we saw before is theoretically proven to work also in um, general uh, queuing networks as long as the routing is predefined, as long as you know what is the path that uh, you're gonna take. So uh, this story takes place in the city of Dublin. And uh, what we see here is um, part of the path of uh, a bus that is called 46A that um, goes through the city. And uh, this bus is a very nice one. It starts from the uh, suburbs, goes through the city center, moves back to the suburbs. And the, the thing that we want to deal, deal with here is travel time prediction. Um, you start with one uh, bus stop, you know where you're heading, and you want to know how long it takes. So uh, we've all seen that before. We have uh, different uh, uh, apps for that. And uh, we want to make um, good prediction on this, um, on this travel time. So our data looks like this. So uh, we have this log. Um, events are numbered. And then journey ID, this is actually part of um, the description of the bus plus the route and that creates uh, a journey um, ID. 
If you look at the right, there is a journey pattern. This is bus 46A using pattern number one. And uh, we get uh, pings every 20 seconds with the timestamp, um, the nearest bus stop, the GPS location, and some additional information. Now, the way that we see the data here is very nice, but there is a lot of work that is spent behind it on cleaning the data, um, looking where, where do we miss values, uh, we may have erroneous recordings and so on. This is also um, a reasonably large um, um, data set uh, where we get uh, for each month one and a half million readings of buses throughout uh, the city. And uh, some of the data is, uh, can be added from external resources, for example, uh, we know the uh, station sequencing per pattern. So if this is 46A pattern one, and the bus is now in a specific stop, 846, we know what will be the next, uh, the next stop of the bus. Okay, so you may ask yourself, so what is the connection between queuing, as we've seen it so far, and, and smart cities? So um, to understand that, what you really need to do is to step away uh, from the metaphor that we use so far. So you need to think of a queuing network as a system that has scarce resources and agents that struggle to get hold of them. So sometimes the struggle is really passively done. You sit in a waiting room and you wait your turn. In other cases, you actually need to do something physical like moving from one place to the other. And this actually brings us to uh, looking at the bus journey as a queuing network. So we look at the bus stops as being the stations or where the service happens. And in between them, uh, we have segments that are basically are queuing. Okay, so um, there is also the notion of intercase here because buses may compete with other buses on the road or uh, with other cars. Okay, and uh, so whenever we move from A to B, this is our waiting time. This is what we call as uh, we consider queuing here. Okay, so that's the interpretation of queuing networks coming um, in, in smart cities. Now, um, since you've already seen uh, one example of the snapshot prediction, let's see a, a visual understanding of what it means. So um, what you see here is um, um, a diagram that horizontally looks at the spatial component. So you move to, from one bus, bus stop to the other by moving from left to right. The vertical axis is the time axis. So the further down you go, the further in the future of time, okay? And now we are basically where the star is, and this is a bus position. And what we see on, on the right at the bottom is the point where we reach our destination. But we don't know that point when we are in the star. And the prediction is basically the difference between uh, the time that we see um, uh, with the dashed line and the final time point. So how do we use the snapshot prediction here? So imagine each of these lines, like the gray lines, it's also the colored ones, represent um, a path of uh, a bus between the two stops, okay? Now, it doesn't have to be, obviously, it's not the same bus, <clears throat> but also it doesn't have to be a bus of, with the same pattern. All we need is to know about all those buses that started from one stop and moved to the other while they were traveling through the city. So we have all these gray lines and a snapshot prediction uh, tells us to look for the last bus that went through this um, uh, specific segment and use its uh, length of stay in uh, between the two segments, uh, between the two stops as um, your prediction. So uh, have a look at the blue line. Uh, we chose this line to represent the first part of the, uh, of the trip for our bus. Note that there are two other gray lines below it, but we didn't use them because we don't have the prediction yet because they did not reach their destination yet. There is also one gray line above the blue one, which we don't use 
because the blue one was the latest one. So we move to the next segment and we add the green one and the red one and the purple one. So basically we are constructing a virtual path for our bus from the point of the star until the final uh, position. And we do that by mixing, um, uh, in this case, the green, red and, and purple is not mixing is obviously of the same bus, but the blue one comes from a different bus. And then you simply compute how long it took using this uh, virtual segment. So this is how we use snapshot prediction um, in the smart city um, case. Um, any questions so far? I, I have one, Avi. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a way of, a Markovian way of thinking. The following says that you, you use the last as, you know, the la, uh, it's, it's nice because you use the last that is in, my se in the same situation as I was. Right, yeah. But uh, you don't look, I mean, uh, the previous bus stop. So you, you, you don't look uh, itineraries that take from the starting till the, the, the current bus stop you are. But you could do it. You could yes. start. Yes. So um, the snapshot print prediction or the snapshot principle is very simple. It assumes that the system is continuously busy and busy in more or less the same way, or at least if it changes, it doesn't change from the last customer that went in until the time that you're in line. So in that sense, it's very simple. Um, I'm later going to show how, how it's actually fared with respect to other methods. But you're right in the sense that um, taking from the queuing theory, the snapshot prediction is a very simple way of um, representing our prediction. Um, okay. May I ask also a question here? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, would it be also possible to choose those unfinished cases? I was thinking if, for example, there is a bus and uh, the context is closer to the current case, for example, if there is a traffic, we will suffer the same traffic. So that model, unfinished case might be more relevant. Is it possible to do that? Not, not, not theoretically. So obviously you can think of some kind of a heuristic that will uh, take the part that you already did, use the laws of uh, kinematics and somehow um, foresee how that works in the whole segment. That's fine. But if you look at the snapshot prediction, what you're suggesting is a, as if I go to a customer that is halfway in line and I ask them how long you've waited and then I multiply it by two because this is half of the, half of the queue. So it's a heuristic. It does not have any um, theoretical uh, insurances. Now, where, when would you like to do it? If before, let's say that before these two brain lines, uh, there is nothing there for maybe six hours, then you can say, oh gosh, this is uh, way too much. So I'm going to use whatever information I have. Okay. Right. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So, um, we have, um, um, beyond the snapshots, we also get additional information and then uh, kicks in the, um, um, the machine learning aspect. So if you're a data scientist, you will immediately try and think about these features. So uh, since the snapshot predictor by itself is only a number and it misses many of the context, and uh, I guess this is part of, for example, a mean question was related to that, uh, you need to know the day of the week, the time of day. Uh, you may know what will be future traffic state because you already know that there is a blockage because of a, a sports event or what have you. And uh, basically with using these as features, we can um, use machine learning in order to learn these uh, uh, patterns. So we'll take again the same um, situation that we had before. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, code it in the system as machine learning features. So one feature, feature one here is day of the week, feature two is hour, minute, second. Feature three would be our snapshot prediction. And feature four will tell us how long has it been since the last bus was passing through this, um, uh, this uh, specific uh, segment. Obviously more features may be, uh, may be added, um, uh, we chose four of the most obvious ones uh, just to be able to demonstrate what um, uh, our point here. Avi, Avi, yeah. sorry to 
people interrupting again. Can, can you go backwards? Like, this is very interesting. So I, I was wondering why not a, a feature that summarizes the evolution uh, uh, of the of your itinerary from the initial stop. I would say, for instance, the so you go through stops, and this has an angle with respect to the you know the flat line from the start mm -hmm. to end. And what about the average of the angles that you, actually it's giving you some insight on the congestion? Are you using this type of things? So in in the paper and what we present here, we use only these four features. Um, um, but this is you know as the feature engineering goes. Um, it depends on whatever the expert tells you. So, you know, an expert can possibly tell you, you know, the most uh, predictive things that I've seen is how long it takes to go by the city hall. And then, you know, you, you may consider adding that as a feature because it's, uh, it, it makes sense to you. Um, so I'm not saying this is a perfect model. I'm just saying that we chose these features because we want to show how the snapshot principle uh, builds into the machine learning, uh, but definitely um, your suggestion of looking at the uh, pattern of behavior uh, of the bus itself, in addition of looking at the pattern of behavior of the different segments of the road, makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so um, once we have that, we use the features and we construct them, uh, including the time, the snapshots, uh, the how long it was from the previous snapshot and so on. Now, uh, I need to emphasize here that he, this is not, uh, this is the, the green path, the, 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 the green path that we had before in Arik's presentation. This is not necessarily going through the model because uh, we took the snapshot as yet another feature, okay? It's just a number for the machine learning tool to use it doesn't mean anything uh, semantics. Uh, uh, there is no semantics in that. So, um, but, and I'll get back to the semantics later on, but now just to show you what we did with the machine learning, uh, we basically took uh, a, a type of decision tree. For those of you that are not familiar with decision trees, basically uh, the model is constructed in a way that there are decision points along the way and you have to, when you have a new instance, you just follow those. So for example, start hour, if it's less than 9.87, you choose a value of 72. But if it's more, then you have to look at the start hour, is it before or after uh, 3.15, uh, and then you, you reach a decision. Okay, so this is the model of decision trees that is being learned from uh, data. Um, what we used was an ensemble of decision trees. And um, there are two ways of doing it. I won't get too much into the details. One of them is by taking random trees, random forest, um, building multiple trees, and then aggregating them together. The other one is um, boosting a tree. So you start with one tree, you understand the, the fallacies of it, the error, and then you move to the next one and you continue and do that until you reach a tree that you're satisfied with, okay? So think about this boosting. This first tree can be any tree. I can choose part of the data, run my learning algorithm and decide that this is the right tree. And from this time on, I will try to improve on it. And we use the um, uh, other boost, gradient tree boosting and, and so on. Now, what if we take this part of the tree and instead of putting uh, the tree result, we'll simply put the snapshot result, okay? So we took um, a situation, we built a queuing network out of it, we're applying the snapshot principle on top of it, and we use that as the initial search space, uh, initial search point in our search space to, to get the machine learning to work. Now, this is really the path two that we chose because path one gave us the snapshot and path two gives us how to use the snapshot in a way that we can feed it into a machine learning tool. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show a little bit the result just to, to show you the, the main um, uh, understanding of what we had. So what we had, have here on the left, these are the different um, uh, tools that we use. S stands for snapshot. 
All the others are machine learning algorithms, different variations of the trees. When we say S plus something, we mean that we start the boosting process with a snapshot principle, and then we move through the, the boosting thing. Now, we use three different measures, RMSC, MER, and, and MDARE. Um, they are a little bit different. RMSC is more sensitive to outliers, the, IL, the others less so. Um, without getting into the details, the results here are represented for each of these measures. The red ones show the worst performance, the green ones show the best performance, and between any combination of a machine learning and S plus the machine learning, this is where we get the best of the two. So the first interesting um, observation is that uh, snapshot principle gives the worst RMSC. So this is our worst prediction just by using the snapshot. Well, theoretically, this is the best uh, uh, we can do um, in terms of, of statistics, in terms of queuing theory. Now, when we look at the green stuff, we see that in each of these um, um, measures, it takes not just the tree itself, but the tree with the starting point of the snapshot to reach the best results. It's interesting because when you look at the, at the uh, black ones, you see that any two um, uh, alternatives you compare, a tree or a tree starting with a snapshot, the snapshot is always better. So what we get from here is that snapshot by itself, the, the queuing theory by itself is not good enough. Machine learning by itself is not good enough. Snapshot pins the, the proximity of where we, the, the trees uh, or where the machine learning algorithm should look. So it solves some of the problems of um, uh, local um, uh, optimization um, and local um, uh, um, uh, minimization of the, of the data. And in that sense, um, it is uh, our best, it, it is our advice to use both of them. So the path one plus path two works better than just using path one or using the green path that Arik showed at the beginning. And with that, um, Arik, please move the torch to Matthias. Unless there are any more questions while we do that. There are not, and we are a bit uh, short of time. Yes. So I would suggest you move on. Right, yeah. Welcome also from my side. Um, I now want to start with a challenging obvious assumption. Uh, because, well, he talked about buses in Dublin, but I once took a bus in, in Brisbane, actually, and at some point the, the driver pulled over, turned to the, um, to the passengers, and asked whether somebody would know where he has to drive. Because it turns out it was his first shift, and he was not really sure, and he actually missed uh, a certain turning point at a junction. But okay, this uh, obviously happens very rarely. That's not the usual case. Usually we know where, where buses go, go along. But um, Avi also had this example of the, of the hospital. And now we have the hospital. And um, there, of course, sometimes we have those processes where the routing is predetermined because there are scheduled treatments and we know exactly which uh, steps to follow. But then there are those other scenarios and I probably don't have to motivate that any further. You, you know that in a hospital, a lot of things are decided ad hoc. And then suddenly, right, this routing for the process, for the patient, for the, for the case is no longer predefined, right? It's no longer static, but it, uh, it becomes stochastic. And that in particular means that, um, yeah, the question is whether our snapshot principle that we just uh, heard about uh, still works and theory tells us it does not. Um, and we'll see um, that this is actually the case. So as soon as this routing becomes stochastic, we have to think about a different way to do those prediction tasks. And here I now wanna come back to this uh, overview figure by Arik, um, recalling that we have those two different paths. So the path one saying that we get from the data to a queuing model that we then use for prediction or the path two, where we actually go back to machine learning and incorporate features that are uh, derived from such a queuing model. And I wanna quickly now summarize two, um, um, two approaches that, or talk about those two ways that we can do as soon as we are in a setting, like in a hospital process that is not pre-planned, where the routing is stochastic and not uh, predefined. So let's start with that um, 
pass one approach. So there, what can we do? Well, we, or most of you probably know process mining, process discovery. So we can try to follow a similar approach here, just discover a model that um, includes the discovery of the routing, right? So in the end, well, this is uh, very much like we would discovery, do discovery if we look at control flow information only. We look at all the dependencies that can occur or that occur in the log and then generate a model. However, we also know that if we do this in a, for instance, hospital scenario where there's a lot of uh, variance in, in how things are, how the process is handled, then we end up with those famous spaghetti model, which means that we need generalization capabilities. And uh, most of you probably also know how this generalization works for the control flow perspective. So we may, you may have seen in process mining tools, those sliders, right, that can be turned up and pulled up and down. And then, for instance, eliminate some edges or also aggregate stuff, right? So it clusters certain parts of the process to provide a more general model. And here, as soon as we now discover models that can be used for performance prediction, which may be models like, for instance, a GSPN, that's what we used in the work that is referenced here, um, a generalized stochastic petri net, so a petri net that is extended with, uh, for instance, um, transition delays and, and, and firing probabilities, and therefore enables us to do performance analysis. Then we want to have this generalization, not only for the control flow information, but also for the performance information. And that is exactly um, what we also targeted in, in some work. So um, defining mechanisms to aggregate and eliminate the performance information in the discovery of such a performance annotated model. So that should be, well, just one slide on this uh, particular approach. I want to talk a bit longer, even so I still have my eyes on the, on the clock, about this second part. We are now in the second part. We um, want to use a model that is uh, that that gives us information that can then or gives us features that can then be fed into such a machine learning pipeline very much as we've seen it already okay so um before I come to uh, one specific approach, um, I want to review what people have done on one slide in general to capture those intercase um, dependencies. Arik mentioned that at the very beginning that many of those predictive tasks, right, typically look at first intra-case intra um, features. So um, if you have a patient, we may look at the diagnosis code, we may look at the age of the patient, and all this may be variables that have high predictive power when it comes to um, a certain prediction, temporal prediction target. However, there may also be those intercase dependencies, right? And um, here are two works mentioned. Um, um, the first one was, uh, I guess, one of the first that actually now try to combine those intracase features with all two intercase features. And um, features that were proposed there were, for instance, right, the number of patients that is currently in the system. So how many uh, patients do we need to treat uh, at a particular point in time? But you may also consider that to be, or do this more fine-grained and a more fine-grained level, right? So may you look at the patients that wait for a certain particular activity only, that are in a certain stage in, in our system, or also patients that are of a particular type. Right, so um, in a hospital setting, maybe uh, the patients that have a certain severe condition, that is exactly what uh, determines the load and not the overall number of patients. Um, quick pointer here to also to, to some very, very recent work um, on, on also taking this one step further and looking at, uh, at, at techniques to support the feature engineering, which in the end that is, um, to by some means that, that is based on a certain visualization of, of event log data performance spectrum. So Eva and Dirk um, will talk more about this uh, very soon at ICPM uh, 20 and in particular show you for, for instance, features that incorporate intercase dependencies in terms of batching may be identified and incorporated. Okay, now in the reminder, however, I want to take a different, uh, a different approach to come to those features. And that is an approach that is based on a notion that we call congestion graphs. And that is a general model as we'll see here, also grounded in queuing theory. And here the particular point uh, about this, that this does not require expert knowledge. So this is something that we can purely derive from an event log, those features. Um, without having a priori knowledge um, that, for instance, um, a certain step is, uh, is crucial and therefore the 
length of the queue in front of this step um, is, a, is a feature with high predictive power for a certain prediction target. Now, how do we proceed? Well, we have this event log and we first generate something that we call congestion graphs. So there's a uh, paper that appeared at uh, AAAI two years ago. And um, then from those congestion graphs, we would then extract features and add those features to the event log similar in a similar way as Avi just did that with the um, snapshot predictors, uh, snapshot features. Now, what is such a congestion graph? Well, in essence, it's a graph and uh, the graph structure is, is very simple because we have vertices that are the events, or actually more precisely the event types from the log. And then the edges are uh, uh, what many of you know just as the plane directly follows relation. So we, whenever events follow up on each other for a certain case in the log, we, we, we have an edge in this particular graph. So this is not spectacular. This, this is very, very usual structure of how patients can in general go in that process um, that you probably are very well aware of. So how does that look like? Well, we have an event log. We derive this, this graph of the different transitions between the, the activities and in practice, of course, it doesn't look like such a toy example here, but it looks more, more complicated. Um, for instance, the example here that is uh, related to the same data set that Ari used already. Okay, now the interesting bit about the congestion graphs is not the structure, but is the labeling because the labeling is what captures now dynamics. And um, these, um, these labels for the vertices of this congestion graph are derived um, from a general queuing model that I come to in a second. And then those labels actually serve as the features that we add to our event log, enriching it thereby, and then feeding it into our regular machine learning pipeline. Now, what is this queuing model that we use? Um, as a basis here, that is something that in the literature is known as a Jackson network or more precisely generalized Jackson networks, where, um, which is a very, very general um, queuing network model where we have a network of, of single station queues. There are a couple of um, assumptions on, on how the routing is done, for instance. The important bit is that the routing is, is stochastic. So it's actually um, 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 the after a certain case finishes one station, um, it is drawn from a distribution uh, which, uh, which station the, the case would move to. And um, there are also further assumptions like a first come first serve uh, um, service policy. And um, um, yes, so that is a general network or queuing model. Um, and now there's a certain analogy of this model to our structure of the congestion graph that we've just seen. Because um, the analogy is here that we can now think of this congestion graph actually as such a generalized Jackson network, where each of the edges corresponds to one of those stations of this uh, queuing network. And when doing so, we can now exploit that um, it is known that the state of such a generalized, generalized, station, uh, generalized Jackson network can be described by, by a triple of three aspects, and that is the queue length at each of those stations, as well as the time that um, the last customer wait, um, entered the queue and the time that the last service at a certain station started. Now, based on this analogy, we can now derive labels for, for our congestion graph. However, we cannot use exactly this information because, well, this is not what we get in the log, right? The length of the queues is not what we typically have available in those event logs. So rather what we do is we come up with an approximation of this particular state. And here um, it's listed what this approximation looks like. So essentially we also have three aspects that we, that we can directly compute from the event log. And that would be the number of patients on outgoing flows, which actually means that there's, this are the number of patients that are currently traveling right, from one activity to the next activity. And we determine that at a particular point in time by simply looking at all the cases that had a certain event as their last event at this particular time point. Right? Um, then we would also aggregate um, the, the time time of all the people that are currently in transition and look at the inter-visit time, so the time between two, the two last visits at a particular station. Now this gives us such a triple, which is then 
well called the Markovian state representation, or actually the approximation of it, um, that we can assign to each of those vertices, and which is time dependent, obviously. And now we may use exactly this Markovian st um, state representation as additional features. So we may take our event log and now as illustrated here, may now add those features um, um, to the event log very much as Avi did that, as I mentioned, for the snapshot um, values already. All right. And then we can go back to our machine learning pipeline, do some, and in the paper we showed how this can be fit into a training validation test scenario where we have some training validation lock. We do this whole feature extraction, um, well, feature generation, um, enrichment of the lock within new features, um, train a model which is then used in a, uh, on a test lock where of course we have to follow that same procedure. Now, in the interest of time, um, I would maybe stop here and first uh, check whether there are questions on the approach, because obviously I would now also have uh, some results to show you um, um, how this looks like if we apply this uh, on a particular um, event lock. But since we are approaching a bit the end of the session, um, maybe it's more or it's, it's more important to, to clarify any question if, you, if there is one. I, I totally agree, Matthias. Is there any question? Uh, because uh, we have like five minutes left and uh, I think it's important to understand this last, very last uh, uh, use case, which is quite involved, let's say. Are there questions from the audience? I just want to confirm if I understood correctly. So the main essence of approach is to convert uh, inter attributes to intra attributes to use the current process mining techniques because we can have uh, the attributes which is related among cases as the attribute in the case. Um, well, was it correct? I'm not sure that I would phrase it that way, but I'm also not sure whether I understand correctly. So let me try to summarize the main point. Um, the point is that uh, if we just look at the <clears throat> event log, we mm -hmm. only have the intra case features readily available. Mm -hmm. Now we also want to have the inter case features, but yeah. uh, we, we now want to have a, an approach that is really grounded, that has a, uh, in, in curing theory, that derives us inter case features that would tell us something about um, the load, for instance, at a particular point in the process at a particular time point as well, right? So mm -hmm. the whole thing exactly. is time varying. And this, in the end, in this enriched event log, then we indeed have both, right? We have this Markovian state representation features because we have them for each of the activities in our process, which corresponds to each of the um, um, stations. And we have obviously still the, the intra-case features. Mm. Good, thanks. If, if I may add quickly, so from a technical point of view, you're right, uh, because in the end, it becomes an attribute inside the case for which you then want to do the prediction, right? So still add it to the case as a, as a data attribute, but it comes from all the other cases. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was interesting because I think it's very relevant for many different cases that we can apply the same techniques. So these machine learning methods, if I may, they usually assume that the lines in the training set are IID. So this exactly turns the log back into an IID log. So you have this independency between the different lines. Uh, I'm a little bit, um, I, I still am not very convinced and I, haven't, I have not seen in your papers experimental evidence that these you know, sophisticated feature extraction methods for in the case will beat simple significantly simple baselines like pulling features like the working process, um, you know, features about the current arrival intensity, etc. Uh, have you kind of done that kind of comparison? Like, like a reasonable set of simple features versus congestion graph based features? So Marlon, uh, you leave me no choice then to come to the experimental results. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I mean, let's, let's see, because uh, you, you ask for reasonable features. Let's, let's see whether I can convince you. Um, 
what, what, we, what we tested, and I now skipped over the description of the data set, um, but, but maybe what is interesting here is that we evaluated different scenarios, in particular in terms of the time span that is covered uh, to make sure that, for instance, we do not run into concept drift um, issues, as well as uh, we considered different baseline methods. And uh, what is considered here in this particular table is, for instance, some long-term average, it's some rolling average um, of the last hour. Now I need to go back. Um, here the, the baseline predictors are, are, are mentioned here at the bottom. Right. It would be the snapshot as, as we have seen it earlier. Also the, the average of the, of the last uh, K patients or the hourly average, right? So two, two different notions of rolling. And um, if, you, if you consider those and I would argue they are reasonable baseline features, but of course uh, the question of what you consider as, 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 as a feature here, right? Um, well, there may be an infinite space of them, but at least if we, uh, if we argue that those are reasonable baseline features, then here we can show um, that indeed those features derived from the congestion graph lead to an improved um, um, prediction accuracy. Um, were that the type of features that you had in mind? Well, I was thinking about Lito's law, right? Lito's law, uh, you know, has WIP and has lambda. So it's, it's all about um, how much, how many cases are there hanging around at the moment? And lambda is an intensity measure. Uh, mm -hmm. So how, how many cases have, have been triggered recently? Uh, or how many cases, you know, how many cases it, it's, so some notion of intensity and some notion of working process, right? Um, and, and, and because in Little's law, CT is determined by those two parameters. Cycle time is determined by WIP and by lambda. So, but I, I think that what you have, the truth is, in all fairness, of course, what you're showing here is, 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 is kind of reasonable, yes. And Marlon, also the MSR is kind of a generalization of Little's because Little's law assumes some kind of a steady state. Um, and we wanted to step away from steady state models, um, but you're right. I mean, there is a question of whether pedestrian queuing theory um, works as good as um, these sophisticated measures in, in, in different scenarios. Right? If across 40 data sets, we're actually going to get better results than pedestrian steady state kind of queuing theory that is known to all. Right? All right. Um, now, let me just mention that based on those uh, congestion features, one can actually also look into feature importance, feature ranking, thereby derive explainability. Um, that is also something where uh, that we addressed, but where there's also maybe here appointed to some, some upcoming work at ICPM from Eindhoven and Aachen. Um, but then, yes, I guess uh, we close it more or less here, Arik, with some final words. Yes, so, uh... We don't have much time, but here uh, the three of us wanted to raise some uh, challenges and opportunities in Q-mining where still uh, there is still room for more uh, research to be done. Um, there are issues on data quality, what happens if some of this crucial data is missing and we cannot construct the appropriate queuing model. Um, there is going to be a paper in ICPM 2020 by our group um, that tries to address some of these issues. Um, there are works happening in privacy considerations in Q-mining. If we publish certain data, we might reveal um, information like patient priority that we might want to keep private. There are fairness aspects of uh, whether Q-mining can reveal and assist in solving. And there is some ongoing work, but, but a, lot, a lot of work needs to be done in the, on the counterfactual analysis side of things. What would happen if I would change the number of nurses from three to five, but this is something that does not appear in the data. How can we estimate the effect of such decisions? Um, and again, to Marlon's point, actionability, how do we, um, how do we properly intervene and uh, optimize our process? So uh, we wanted here to leave the, to kind of open the floor to comments on these topics, but I'm not sure that we have time for that. So we will leave it as food for thought. So um, if there are short comments or questions, uh, I would say from your, from your conclusions that we are, by no means at the end of the story, but just at the beginning of the story, which is a quite nice, uh, you know, perspective that it was not really 
consider it so far in a kind of systematic way as you are doing. So to me, it looks like a, a, a long path with, with very uh, important impact. Uh, but, but if there is any comment from the audience, uh, please let's please comment. Feel free to comment. We have a question here by Akil or a comment. I don't see any question from- There's a hand raised uh, by Akil. Sorry? I see Akil's hand raised, but maybe this is something uh, from previous, from before. Akil Kumar? No, I don't see it. Uh, okay. but maybe it's- I just, saw, I just saw my, my uh, Zoom show hand raised. Yeah, but there's maybe a hand raised, but maybe- yeah, I just have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, how would um, uh, Eric and Matthias, how would these results compare with say, simulation? So simulation, you said? Yeah. Uh, so kind of a rolling horizon, we stop at time P, we then slide the second forward and, uh, and see what is the predicted length of stay. Okay. No, I'm, I'm asking if this is what you mean. Yeah, so, I mean, if you were to simulate this sort of a the system, yeah, so the, we kind of ran these experiments in the recent work, and it seems that it takes a very long time. So it doesn't scale very well to, for every patient to simulate the entire system and then aggregate the results of overall of the patient. So it works okay, but it's not a very scalable approach. You're referring to, to simulating the queuing network, right? But yeah. But starting the, the, yeah. the point T that you want to do predictions, you want to simulate it forward up to some horizon and give. Right, when the patient leaves the hospital, for example, stop the simulation, and then you need to aggregate it over several runs to get some kind of confidence, right? Right. This approach is not uh, very scalable, but it's, 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 com it's definitely competitive. Oh. I, I would suggest for the interest of time to, to stop here. I would like to really thank you for this very interesting tutorial. Uh, I think uh, now there are a bit of time in case you want to contact uh, the, the, panel, the, the tutorial uh, speakers, uh, just a virtual huge clap to the three, to Avi, Matthias and Arik. Such a nice way to the nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope to see you all physically next conference. Yes. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So interesting topic. Um, guys, I got to leave because we have this panel upcoming. Yep, okay. I'm going to join the panel. Bye. 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 Bye.